And I just want to introduce Dr. Jan Maynard, who's a professor of medicine, at, again, at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. She is my partner in crime, so to speak. She is an outstanding oncologist. She uh, does double duty. She's not only a melanoma doc, but she's a great investigational phase one doc. So she's got a lot of talents and she's going to talk about what happens when melanoma metastasizes and spreads. Jan. Thank you. And thanks for all of you for, for coming out on a Saturday morning. Um, I'm delighted to be able to speak. Um, and the topic of my conversation is, can melanoma be cured even if it spreads widely and metastasizes? So this topic will really focus um, mostly on our advanced stage patients um, and sort of give you a high level view. We'll, we'll do a whirlwind tour and, and some of these slides we'll, we'll just glaze over to get some take home points in um, to talk about how, um, how we treat our patients who present with advanced disease. And so a question that, you know, is on almost every advanced patient's mind, and I have stage four, but honestly, this applies to some of our very advanced stage three patients who prevent, present with large tumors that haven't maybe spread, but have a lot of satellites or lymph nodes involved, as Dr. Shapiro showed pictures earlier. And so, you know, what I say to that question is, well, historically, melanoma has been very difficult to treat. Um, I um, started this field on a personal journey um, in 2005 when, when one of my um, attendings at Yale, where I did my oncology fellowship, um, was 47, which is the same age I am now, um, when he walked into the emergency room and I, I was on call with very, very advanced disease that had spread to his brain. Um, and that really was a, a defining moment for me to start exploring um, a career in, in fighting melanoma. We were very good friends. And I remember feeling incredibly helpless in 2005 that despite you know, all this progress we were trying to make in cancer therapy, there was little to do um, that we could do to help him. Well, well, guess what? The world has changed in a big way. Um, and that's really from, you know, folks like, you know, Dr. Weber and his colleagues who were, you know, years, years ahead of me working on these problems. And then my generation who, who rolled up our sleeves and got to work right alongside next to them and patients who have been so generous to go on clinical trials. Um, and so what I say now um, compared to, you know, 2006, 2007, when we were giving chemotherapy and drugs like serafinib that don't work very well in melanoma is that, well, you know, we could at least very likely get what's called a long-term durable remission, um, meaning that we can control the disease for, for, you know, months to years and perhaps even cure. Um, I will say that patients are living longer and better with this disease. And what I, the bottom line of most of the consultations with patients, which I obviously individualize based on the characteristics of the patient in front of me is, well, yes, cure is possible, but it's hard to predict. Um, so this slide sort of just gives us an overview of all of the progress in melanoma, um, which is really concentrated, as you can see, since 2010 on up. It actually doesn't even feature also an improvement of drugs called encorafenib and binimetinib in 2018, um, which we'll talk about briefly. But the bottom line is that we have done a lot of work together as a community. And that, again, really is industry, physicians, academia, and, and obviously the patients and patient advocacy trying to, to make a dent. Um, in this disease. Um, if you look at this slide, what I want you to just focus on um, is where the response rates sort of cluster. And what you'll see in, in the top, um, the 55 to 65% group, um, you know, that is in general our combination immunotherapy strategies. Um, and those are response rates, um, which you see on the, the left hand axis is a proportional live and it extends out on the bottom axis time and months. Um, and, and when those curves flatten, and that means that, you know, we, those are patients where we're, we're, you know, keeping them living them living and living well. Um, uh, at the bottom curves, 20 to 25% are older therapies. And, and we've made a lot of progress since then. I'm going to send, put some cases in um, along the way. So hopefully that will, you know, help sort of um, uh, be uh, represent ways that we can, we can relate to the conversation. Um, so we'll start with this stage four patient, a 45 year old male who has an enlarged and tender liver and an elevated LDH, which is lactate dehydrogenase, uh, um, night sweats and weight loss with uh, his, no history of primary melanoma, um, scans throw, showing uh, multiple lesions in the lung, liver, and bone, and a, a BRAF mutation status, it's not complete. So, so what's the best treatment option? 
Well, in a lot of places, um, we are going to start with this patient with immunotherapy and I'll, I'll give some more details on that as I talk, but you know, immunotherapy is not new. Okay. We've got a long history of, of trying to use immunotherapy to start to fight cancer. I would obviously in the last decade that this has just become quite relevant for our patients with melanoma. Um, and for those of you that may not be familiar, although many of you are, you know, when we use, when we talk about advanced treatment for melanoma, we work with classes of drugs called checkpoint inhibitors. And, and what these do are they sort of take the breaks off the immune system. If you can look at that molecule, the molecules on the bottom where you have interactions of uh, on the left-hand side, different types of immune cells on the right-hand side, immune cells interacting with tumor cells. What these molecules do is, is they block uh, breaks that mother nature has put in place to keep our immune systems behaving. What you want to do with, with immunotherapy is sort of, you know, take that break off and let the immune system um, rev up a little bit so that it can fight established tumors. And the first drug um, which showed progress was a drug called anti-CTLA-4, ipilimumab, Yervoy. It's the first agent to improve survival in melanoma, um, but we use it very little as a single agent, despite the fact that there are some patients who only had this drug and still got some durable responses. And the reason for that is we needed to push this curve that you see on the, on the slide up. We needed to get from a 20% response rate to better, even though, again, some patients did respond to just this drug alone. Um, and so, you know, just in two, around 20, 2010, 2011, you know, this is where the buzz started building about PD-1 blockade. Um, nivolumab is one drug, pembrolizumab is another. There's, you know, multiple different uh, types of immunotherapy out there at this point that are experimental. But the fact of the matter is when we started to see responses like on the bottoms of this slide where, um, you know, this, what you're seeing in that yellow arrow in the right-hand corner is uh, that big tumor that has regressed into that tiny nodule, um, this got our attention as a field, and it really has been a game changer for our patients. Um, and the interesting thing is while melanoma, lung cutaneous squamous cell, Merkel cell really do derive the most benefit, this, this paradigm translates about across multiple types of tumors. Um, and that sort of just drives home why it's so important. So, you know, when I, when we, when I meet a patient, of course, we talk about you know, you know, the ultimate goal is cure for, for almost nine times out of 10. And I would say that, um, you know, it obviously always remains an objective. The question that we often ask is when do we use immunotherapy alone and in combination and, and how do we make those choices? Well, let's go back to the stage four patient. Um, so this, this patient had, um, has a, a scattered lung nodules with, uh, now the BRAF mutation back is back and it's negative and the LDH is normal. What, what do we do next? Um, so, so to answer this question, I'm going to review some data from a, a very important study of, of when we tried to test um, the combination of, of uh, CTLA-4 and PD-1 versus PD-1 alone versus CTLA-4 alone. Um, and this was done in a large randomized trial, but what's important to know is that it was not necessarily statistically designed to uh, test superiority between the PD-1 alone and the PD-1 combination group. Um, nonetheless, um, certainly got our attention. These are old slides. The first time this was presented, however, that um, we started to clearly see a, a, a superiority benefit of any regimen that combined PD-1. Um, and obviously the, the challenge is that while the combination therapy was um, numerically a, a, a superior number to single agent, um, and the complete response rate was higher. Those, again, statistically, those arms weren't designed to, to test that question necessarily. Um, so what that means is, you know, we now take a look at, at these curves and we, we tails of these curves, as I was saying before. And what you see on the top is that the orange and blue curves, both of which can included a PD-1 agent, obviously um, those patients have higher response rates and longer survival. Um, and, and this is something that really just, just changed the game in, in how we take care of, of patients with melanoma. Um, so, and, and you'll see this goes out at 12 months, it goes out at 18 months, and I'm gonna show a five-year snapshot in just a second. Um, the fact of the matter is that we do obviously deliver these drugs with caution because immune side effects can be unpredictable. Um, I, these you know, side effects with the combination that uh, the incidence of grade three or four rates, um, which uh, of toxicity rates are, are higher. We have to be more careful. Um, but the fact of the matter is that, um, you know, we see that even with toxicity, patients live longer and, and, and hopefully better. 
Um, so when would we choose just one agent versus two? A lot of it has to do with the patient again in front of us. So and, and so advanced stage in terms of more tumor, in terms of higher LDH, um, most of us based on these data and based on our clinical experience will reach for a combination regimen. Um, even with the expense of toxicity, the higher response rate and the potential for longer survival is justified. Um, and these are the five-year survival curves that I promised. Um, what was compelling to me and always has been is that even with that trial that I just mentioned, even if the two groups weren't necessarily designed for a statistical comparison, we do have numerical differences in the combination versus a single agent arm. And, and that to me, again, says that certainly when I have a patient with more aggressive disease reaching for that combination therapy is justified. So the take home points of this piece are that immunotherapy, both single and multi-agent regimens can induce long-term durable remissions and some patients will be cured. We don't know, we don't have the tools yet to know at that outset who those patients will be. We get a sense of how things are going with each passing scan as a new data point. Um, and this is why long-term follow-up really is essential um, for patients who have had um, if any kind of, of therapy for metastatic disease. But I will say that these agents changed, changed um, the way we practice and it changed the lives of many patients with advanced melanoma. In terms of patients who have mutations in BRAF, um, so this is that same patient that we talked about um, initially, uh, scattered lung nodules, but now we've got the BRAF mutation back and it's positive with the normal LDH. Well, what would we do? Um, so targeted therapies are therapies that we take in a pill form and they, they arrest the um, signaling of a, of a pathway called uh, uh, driven by BRAF V600E or K. Um, it's a very powerful oncogenic tumor driver. Um, and essentially, I remember sitting in the audience when these scans were first shown and, and being just so excited to see you know, very, very dramatic changes in, in tumor burden. Um, I've, I've actually had patients who were on these trials who were bed bound, you know, coming out of bed to, to walk their daughter down the aisle at her wedding. Very, very dramatic responses. But, but what we began to notice as a field is that most patients will eventually progress. And, and part of our issue has been that even though we're devoting a lot of time to studying how these tumors become resistant, it's very heterogeneous. There isn't one necessary mechanism of resistance. And, and because of that, it's been hard to really figure out a, a uniform way to stop that resistance from happening. So when would you give targeted therapy or immunotherapy? And can you cure patients with targeted therapy? Well, the things we look at are things like LDH, the tumor burden and the need for a rapid response. Well, why is that? Because targeted therapy, when it works, it tends to work within, you know, two to four weeks. You often see changes in the patient right in front of you. The patient feels enormously better. Um, a lot of this, however, will also depend on whether or not you have that BRAF test back. And so I echo Dr. George's statement earlier that having those results is just critical to, to proper management of patients in this day and age. And finally, insurance and prescription constraints do obviously intervene in the feasibility of delivering one choice or another. I will say that we've had a long standing trial trying to compare whether immunotherapy followed by targeted therapy is better than targeted therapy followed by immunotherapy. So this trial has recently been stopped because the immunotherapy arm first has been shown to be superior. I will remind you that it's this particular sequence beginning with immunotherapy. Um, there, are, there will be other sequences that I believe we will test. This trial tested very long courses of immunotherapy and targeted therapy treating patients until they progressed on scans. Um, maybe we'll look at shorter courses of targeted therapy first. Um, but the fact of the matter is that this particular study has demonstrated that um, immunotherapy first is the way to go. Um, that being said, there are patients who have um, uh, uh, good and durable responses with targeted therapy alone, especially when um, you're actually having um, some little bit of lower tumor burden to start. So what you see here is, you know, the graph on the right, 52% of um, two-year overall survival, uh, a two-year two -year overall survival rate of 52% in patients treated with dibrafenib trametinib, which is not that different from what we were seeing with our immunotherapy patients. But what we did learn is when you break that down by um, when the, where the patients uh, present in terms of elevated LDH and how many organs are involved, the patients with less disease do better. And, and that's honestly a common sense principle that I think we've found to be true. So, so there are some patients where we can salvage with targeted therapy alone and, and get them to long-term durable remissions as well.
Um, I put this up to just sort of give a shout out to all the regimens that have been tested. Um, there are three different types, encorafenib, binimetinib, uh, vemurafenib, uh, cobimetinib, and dabrafenib, trimetinib. Um, and, you know, people ask me, patients will ask me, well, which one is the best, you know, hard to say without true cross trial comparisons, but I will say a lot of us are very pleased with the, um, overall response rate and what appears to be a superior overall survival for the encorafenib and binimetinib, not to mention that that regimen in particular has much lower rates of pyrexia, which can really interfere with the patient's quality of life. Um, I'll wrap up with just a couple statements on uh, patients who have brain metastases because they definitely are a population that needs to be approached with special care. Um, so this patient presented with headaches, visual changes, uh, MRI with um, a mass with edema, um, swelling around the mass, who's had surgery and we're waiting on the BRAF status. Well, what do we do next? Um, so, you know, what we know for patients with brain lesions is that this is, again, patients who, you know, definitely have um, the ante up in terms of us, you know, having a challenge to fight together. Um, what we look at when we're trying to develop treatment paradigms is what the status of the disease outside the brain is, how many brain metastases there are, if symptoms are present, and if um, part of the nervous system called the leptomeninges is involved. And this really is, I'm so proud to work at NYU because we have such a good multidisciplinary team um, in terms of close communication with neurosurgery, radiation, medical oncology. We are in lockstep with each other. Um, and I think it's important because historically surgery and radiation were all we had, but obviously that doesn't fight tumors outside the brain. And it only, it only uh, treats uh, tumors locally. It doesn't treat new, new disease that might be percolating. Um, so with the advent of immunotherapy, um, my colleague Hussein Tabi led a study looking at um, combination ipilimumab and nivolumab for patients with brain lesions. Um, and happy to say that this definitely showed evidence of efficacy. I, I have patients um, who have were part of these trials at, at NYU. I think it's important to recognize that, you know, this was a population where we really could do very, very little and, and we're making serious strides. Um, so I think it's important to note that, you know, this slide shows that survival by extracranial, intracranial, and then the global is the combination of those two, um, two measures. But nonetheless, all of these patients are getting, um, all, all these categories are showing benefit. Um, and this is an overall survival curve from the 2018 pivotal paper, which again is really quite impressive. So, th so this really, ipilimumab and nivolumab is, is often what I reach for first. Um, I didn't talk too, too much about targeted therapy just because um, that is not something that we generally use to cure patients um, with brain disease, although it does have um, response. It does have a, a lot of um, activity and, and again, tumors will shrink. They just tend not to stay that way. Um, I think that our local therapies and how we integrate that with targeted and immunotherapy is going to be very, very important to helping to cure patients with, with brain disease. And we now have a population of patients who have, you know, have second line um, uh, uh, brain metastasis recurrence, meaning that they've gone through ipilimumab, nivolumab radiation. What are we going to do next? And I think this is an area that we are really trying to design rational clinical trials um, to help because it's, it's um, you know, for the first time ever, it's a population that is in front of us and, and we need to respond to the challenge of helping to treat them. So I will say we've got progress, not perfection. Okay, I would, this, this is a schematic um, in 2020 for the first time um, ever, we had um, you know, an American Cancer Society report showing that the death rates in, in the country were declining and very, very sharply driven by both melanoma and lung cancer decreases in, in mortality. I do believe that's a result of um, this myriad of therapies we've worked so hard together as a community to develop. Um, I'll mention two novel directions very quickly. You may have heard of the building buzz about a drug called relatlimib. So this blocks another checkpoint called LAG3. Um, so it's a different checkpoint than ones we've played with before. Um, but it, interestingly, um, in data that have been released, comparing it directly to single agent PD-1, uh, it shows a, a quite a dramatic increase in progression-free survival. We're looking at 10 months versus four months. Um, and this is you know, new data out just this year in June. We're looking forward to follow-up. Um, but I do think that if we have an approach that 
is better than single agent PD-1 um, in terms of efficacy. And I don't show the toxicity here, but, but the toxicity is reportedly much gentler than ipilimumab and nivolumab combined. Well, we've got a new regimen to work with, and that's really exciting. I'll mention just briefly about um, uh, TIL therapy. This is a drug called lithalusil, um, and it's a complicated regimen where a tumor needs to be removed, fragmented, expanded, and then a patient gets you know a bit of an intense regimen with lymphodepleting chemotherapy um, with the TIL and IL-2 then given back to the patient. So, so not everybody can get this regimen because it is pretty intense. And also you're, you have to be in a place where you've got enough tumor to harvest and where you can actually wait. But nonetheless, I think the data that have been emerging in populations that are especially resistant to PD-1 therapy is at minimum intriguing. And I think that this may uh, very potentially be something that we start to use uh, in a judicious way. Um, so in my conclusions, melanoma survival has improved due to new therapies. Um, the death rates from melanoma have decreased. I think a patient's disease volume and the tempo of that disease are very important characteristics that guide how we choose our next steps. We do have novel therapies that are in development constantly. Um, we're a vo very motivated community that works together. I think it's very important for patients to hear the facts in consultation with your medical oncologist, but keep the hope. 10 years ago, who knew that we would be where we are with progress, um, that progress can't come quick enough, but we are committed to making it happen. Um, and with, that's the end of my talk, and I'll take any questions.